Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Leon, uh, and I'll be presenting this work, uh, this joint work with uh, Andreas Hulzing, Tanya Lange, and Juval Jerome. Um, so this work is based on lattice-based cryptography, which is a very promising post-quantum secure alternative uh, to the systems we use today. Uh, the key sizes are uh, small enough to, to be practical, and also the, the ciphertext and the signatures are of a reasonable size. Now, there's a lot of active research on theoretical and practical security, but also uh, more and more implementations are available. So uh, what about security of these implementations? Now, this work uh, tries to answer this question by presenting the first side channel attack on a lattice-based signature scheme. Uh, it exploits uh, information leakage from the discrete Gaussian sampler uh, via cache memory. There are more schemes that use uh, discrete Gaussians, but uh, our attack target is Bliss, which is, a, which is an efficient lattice-based signature scheme. And there are more implementations available of Bliss. Um, for instance, Bliss is also included, <coughs> included in StrongSwan, which is a library for an IPsec-based VPN. Um, we didn't attack StrongSwan, but we attacked the research-oriented uh, implementations made available by the authors. Uh, I will briefly introduce cache timing attack. Uh, Juval is going to give a talk after this, and he knows a lot more about this, so I will just keep it to the basics. Uh, so cache memory is a small, fast uh, bank of memory, which is uh, shared among all threads. And it basically tries to uh, bridge the gap between uh, processor speed, which is quite fast, and memory speed, which is quite slow. Now, data is uh, typically st stored in cache lines. And here you see uh, three threads that share the, the L1 cache. And all these threads, they compete for the same resources. <coughs> resources. So they compete for the same, uh, uh, the same amount of, uh, <coughs> they <coughs> compete for the same memory lines. Uh, so data is typically stored in cache lines, and these are, um, yeah, these are typically 46 bytes uh, big. Now, what an attacker can do is he can uh, fill specific cache lines uh, of a shared memory uh, with his own data, um, but he can also flush it. It depends on uh, what, what he wants to do. But for, uh, for this case, just assume he, uh, fills his, uh, he fills specific cache lines with his data. So in this example, the first, the, the top two uh, cache lines are filled with attacker data. Now the attacker will wait, and he will wait for the victim to perform uh, cryptographic operations. And uh, he will notice that some part of the cache has been used by the victim in this cryptographic operation. So in this case, you now see that the first cache line is now containing victim data. And uh, from it, the attacker knows that his data has been kicked out. So he learns uh, the cache line of the data that has been used by the victim, and from it he can derive the actual part of the data that, uh, that the victim has been used for the cryptographic operation. Um, so I will uh, briefly introduce Bliss. Uh, it's a lattice-based uh, signature scheme, so it, um, yeah, it, it, you need quite a bit of uh, lattice theory for this, but I will just uh, keep it to the basics to understand our attack. Now, BLIS stands for Bimodal Lattice Signature Scheme, and it's introduced uh, at Crypto 2013 by uh, Leo Ducas and his co-authors. And uh, as I said, there are uh, some implementations available, and they all use n-true lattices. And n-true lattices are basically polynomials in this ring RQ, where um, it's basically a polynomial ring, <coughs> polynomial ring where uh, the polynomials are reduced um, by x to the power n plus one, and the degree of the degree n is a power of two, and each coefficient of these polynomials are reduced mod q, where q is a prime. Now, uh, if you want to add two polynomials, it's basically just adding the coefficients. But if you want to multiply polynomials, you get a you typically get a polynomial with a higher degree, so you also have to reduce uh, by this polynomial. Um, so. There are two ways of doing this. You can do this uh, via, for instance, the number theoretic transform. But um, I find it more easy, and also for this attack, to just assume, <coughs> to just uh, think about it as a vector matrix multiplication. Now, this bold phase, uh, bold, 
bold letter F and uh, G. These are the coefficient vectors of the, of the, of the, <coughs> of the polynomials. And these uh, capital F and G, these are the um, uh, matrices whose columns are the rotations of these, um, of these uh, coefficient vectors. And they get an opposite sign because of the, the plus one over here. So basically, if, you, if we want to multiply polynomials, it's just a, a vector matrix multiplication. So the secret key in Bliss uh, consists of two, two vectors, or uh, two polynomials, uh, f and 2g plus 1. And both f and g are sparse, and they have their uh, entries typically in plus or minus 1 and 0. So they have a lot of zeros, and some, some of them are plus 1, some of them are minus 1. Um, the public key A also consists of two polynomials, and they uh, satisfy the, the, the equation you see here. So A1 times S1 plus A2 times S2, <coughs> S2 is uh, Q mod 2Q. Um, how this is typically computed is to take um, a polynomial AQ, which is uh, simply 2G plus 1 divided by F, and you restart if F is not convertible. So it's basically... Uh, the second uh, secret key vector divided by, or secret key polynomial divided by the, the first secret key polynomial. And then uh, you can take A to be two times this um, division polynomial and uh, a constant Q minus two. Now, an attacker can uh, validate correctness for any candidate he has for the key simply by plugging it in into this equation. And um, from it, he can, try, he can simply derive the, the second key. And if they are both small, uh, they will suffice for the secret key. Now, what's also important here is that both uh, minus S and S, they are um, good enough uh, to, to sign um, <coughs> for a secret key. So they can be used as a secret key. Um, I will give a simplified version of the Bliss algorithm. There are a lot more steps involved, but this is basically what's uh, what's being used in the attack. So the first um, step is to sample a discrete Gaussian vector. Um, this is a noise vector, and it has to have this specific uh, distribution. I'll come back to that later. But this is the first step in the, uh, in the algorithm. And you use this noise vector uh, together with public key A to construct the vector U. Um, from it, you, um, you derive a, a challenge uh, vector C. And C is the output of a hash function which outputs um, sparse binary vectors. So here you see the sparsity is uh, a parameter kappa, and kappa is usually much smaller than uh, the, the dimension n. Um, then you, set a, uh, you, pick, you pick a random bit, and you set the first uh, signature vector to be the, the sum of the noise vector plus the secret key times your challenge. And you, um, you reduce it all mod 2q. And then this is uh, the, the signature for a message mu. Now note that I'm using a subscript n, so there's also a subscript 2. But um, the second, the second uh, z2 signature vector, it loses information of the secret key, so we will not use it. And also, like I said previously, um, you only need the first uh, secret key vector anyway. Um, now note that uh, the secret key is sparse. And the challenge is also uh, sparse and binary. So we don't need to do the modulo 2q. This is just simply, um, this is simply an equation uh, that holds over the integers. And here c is the, <coughs> the rotation, like the n-true lattice, basically, of the, um, of the challenge vector. And so what we get eventually is uh, an equation that's hidden um, in the signature over the integers, which is uh, the first signature part is the sum of, well, the noise vector and uh, the secret key times this uh, matrix which we construct from the challenge vector. And the unknowns to the attacker are uh, the noise vector, this bit B, and uh, the secret key, of course. So uh, why do we use a discrete Gaussian distribution? Well, uh, this is used to achieve both provable security and the smallest signature size possible. Um, it's actually not straightforward to sample from this, dist <coughs> this distribution in practice. 
So it really looks like the, the normal Gaussian distribution, but it's only defined over the integers. And it's not simply just um, sampling a Gaussian, um, sample a normal Gaussian and then round to the integer. You, you get a slightly different uh, distribution which, which makes the proofs uh, not hold anymore. Um, so this makes it a good target for a side channel attack because, well, it's, it's also not known net if, <coughs> not known net, <coughs> not known yet if this is doable in constant time. Um, so, but first let us uh, let ourselves ask the question, um, how do we use this additional knowledge of this noise factor to find the secret key uh, S? So note that I'm, I dropped the, the subscript one, but think about it, this, there's always a subscript one but it's hidden. Um, so I'll be discussing three uh, attack scenarios, and the first one is just to give an example, like what can you do? And the second and the third one, they are, uh, they are attack scenarios we have actually uh, implemented. Um, so again, we have this uh, signature equation um, that holds over the integers, and suppose we can determine uh, any y completely from a, from a side channel attack. So every noise coefficients, we, we just know it. Well, then we only need one signature, and we can solve uh, the following equation just by a linear solver. Uh, we still don't know bit b, but like I said before, minus s and s are both valid as, as a secret key, so this is, uh, this is doable. Um, but it might be rather unlikely to have so much power in a side channel attack. I don't think the Gaussian samplers are that bad. <laughs> But um, yeah, let's move on to the second scenario. So I've uh, zoomed in a bit because we, yeah, we, we don't get everything anymore, but suppose uh, we get some of these noise values. So we might have, sometimes we get y zero, but sometimes we get y n minus one. We, we sometimes get, a, uh, get some of these coefficients. <coughs> now, um, this set is, uh, we assume this set is small, and that's also what we've seen in practice. Uh, typically, you get either none of these noise uh, coefficients or you get one. Now, um, if we zoom in, then uh, we still have, um, we have this equation, so we just have the inner product of the challenge. Oh yeah, <coughs> uh, th these are the rotations of the challenge factor. It's not that, that we have uh, n challenge factors, these are all these rotations we had before. Um, so one thing we can do is that if we have, uh, if we know the uh, noise coefficient, we save the corresponding uh, row of the challenge, or this, the corresponding rotation, and uh, we save uh, it together with uh, with C, with the corresponding signature vector, uh, signature coefficient. Uh, you basically save everything you know about this equation. Now we can acquire enough of these factors uh, from multiple signatures and we form the following set of equations. Now as you see here, this bit B is uh, randomized for each signature. So, and I, like I said before, you, you, uh, you would have to have um, N of these uh, signatures to get to this um, set of equations. So um, you cannot use a linear solver. You cannot guess this bit B. We assume this bit B is well protected. Um, so unfortunately, all bits B are unknown, but we can apply a small trick that if we know the, um, the um, if we know the noise coefficient, we can be selective and ensure that the noise coefficient is equal to our signature coefficient, which is simply, simply <coughs> which is something we can simply check, and then we save our uh, corresponding uh, challenge rotation because we would eliminate bit B. So here you see again this equation, but ZI now equals YI. So we get uh, an inner product um, uh, which, which is equal to zero. Uh, this happens with quite a high probability because uh, S is sparse and the challenge is also sparse. So that's something we can do and then we can acquire enough of these factors uh, from multiple signatures and then we know that the secret uh, factor S times the, um, the, the, the challenges we collected, which we form a matrix of, um, this is, this is equal to the all zero vector. So with very high probability, the secret vector S will be the only vector in the integer left kernel of uh, the matrix we just formed. So this is uh, something we can solve for. Um, so now let us go one step further. Uh, we don't have uh, specific values anymore for, uh, for, an, for a noise coefficient, but we have tuples. 
So for example, uh, in Bliss 1, we got the situation that we know it's either a 7 or an 8. So one of these values is true. Um, however, if we look at the outcome, then in 90% of the time, it was a 7 that has been sampled and not an 8. So there's like this bias. It's not 50-50% probability in these tuples. There's a bias towards one of them. So with very high probability, one of them is likely to be the sampled value. So we can apply the same method as previous. If we know that it's, uh, it's in this tuple, we save uh, and, and we, we uh, ensure that the corresponding uh, signature coefficients is equal to the most likely uh, sampled value. Then we save the corresponding um, uh, challenge uh, rotation. Now, uh, we do not get the all zero vector anymore as an outcome of, the, of this multiplication. Um, but we know it's small. We didn't make that many errors. We, we had this bias towards the outcome. Now we can use this uh, magical LL algorithm to compute small vectors. And we search for S in the uh, unitary transformation matrix. So S pops out some small vectors and, some, and a unitary transformation matrix. And we simply just brute force search this, this unitary transformation matrix. And we can always verify correctness uh, with the public key if we found it. So this is also something we can do. Um, I will now uh, briefly give a, um, give a feeling of how we attack Bliss, which uses a CDT sampling. So just to wrap up the whole story, um, in Bliss we need to sample this, this noise vector, which is, has this ugly, or this, this weird distribution which is hard to sample from. And we just discussed three attack scenarios using additional knowledge of this, this noise vector. Um, now, as a result, we implemented cache, <coughs> we implemented cache attacks on uh, two discrete Gaussian samplers. They're called the CDT sampling and, and the Bernoulli-based sampling. Um, both of these uh, samplers use table lookups, so they are vulnerable for cache attacks. So how does CDT sampling uh, work? Well, you basically save the cumulative distribution function in a table T, um, and at sampling time, you generate a random value between uh, 0 and 1. And you simply perform binary search uh, to find the sample you want. So um, this looks like a straight line, or like, but if you look very close, it's all dots, because also this function is only defined over the integer. So you just look at, OK, where is this, uh, uh, this random value um, located? Um, now, some speedups are used in practice. For instance, you only use the uh, non-negative values and you, jump, you just pick a random sign at the end uh, because this discrete Gaussian distribution is, distribution is uh, centered around zero. Um, you can also use an additional table I with intervals because this binary search can be quite long. You have to sample a whole vector of these, uh, these discrete Gaussians. And uh, well, if you have a large table, then even this binary search can be quite long. Um, so you use an additional table with intervals. So you basically first pick an interval, and in this interval, you perform a binary search. And this greatly speeds up the, the whole uh, algorithm. Now, um, know that there are two tables, and there are a lot of table lookups. So we can look at uh, specific patterns that allows us to, to get a lot of information of uh, a sampled noise coefficient. And we found two types of cache weaknesses where you get a really, really good uh, precision of the, the, sampled, uh, val the sampled value. Um, so the first type, uh, the, the first weakness is called the intersection weakness. And you basically use the knowledge of uh, the excess in I, so the, um, the, the interval that has been um, sampled and the binary search in the, in the normal table. And you just combine this, this knowledge. There's also a last jump weakness. Um, you basically track down, uh, you track the binary search using multiple accesses in this big table T. Because you have to have uh, more than one access, you do, you're doing a binary search. Um, you sometimes get that uh, you're doing a binary search in one cache line. And then at the end, it jumps to a second cache line. And then you get real precise information. So um, what you can do is you simply brute force search up for all these cache weaknesses uh, using uh, for, for tables T and I uh, from, a, from a specific parameter set. Uh, we assume um, the tables are either from a specific um, 
the tables are constructed in a specific way, we, we assume we know the public parameters. So this is something you can do. And then you're just being selective again. Um, you only pick those weaknesses in which allows you to satisfy uh, scenario three. Um, note that we get tuples again. We don't get a specific value because um, in the last, you, you're doing a last table lookup and afterwards you uh, return one of two values because you're doing a binary search and either it's bigger or uh, smaller than your random value. So you return one of two values. So this is the best precision you can get. Um, and also you can, you can get this high probability, this, this bias outcome, because it's, yeah, that's just because uh, you were talking about a table with, uh, probability, with probabilities. So this is something that can happen. Um, so we performed some experiments. We first did a perfect side channel uh, experiment, and here you see five different lines for uh, five different um, bliss parameter sets. Uh, the authors made them available, and we just we just used them. Um, note that you um, <coughs> you get a success probability. So if we just collect uh, the number of if we just collect uh, just enough um, just enough signatures to to form this um, this lattice where we, which we which is input to the LOL, then um, yeah the the success probability can be quite low. But if we collect a little more and simply just randomize the whole process. We pick a bunch of factors, which is uh, the lattice basis, and we just perform LOL. Then it quickly grows to 90% um, <coughs> success probability. We also did a proof of concept attack using the flush and reload, uh, flush and reload technique. So here you see a visualization of the last jump weakness. Uh, we want two cache lines to be hit. So here you see uh, one of them is hit, but we also want the other ones. We want like this last jump to the second cache line. So we, we, if both of them are hit, then we know we, we get the information we want. And experiments with, bl <coughs> with Bliss 1, which is uh, for 128 bits of security, they succeeded 90% of the time. Uh, for more details, you can look at the full paper. Uh, we, got, uh, we have a similar attack method and achieved uh, similar results for the Bernoulli-based sampling method. Uh, we also did experiments with that. And in our full paper, which we updated yesterday, there's also uh, analysis of the cache weaknesses of the knut sampler and the discrete cigarette samplers. So yeah, for more details, uh, check the full paper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.